So this, well, this, well you want to narrate it for us? It's a collapsed wall in uh, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. And so this is relevant to what we were talking about last time. I guess we don't need the sound. Uh, it's a vertical wall in a roadway. You can see the wall there. It follows super heavy rains. Is that the picture? And so super heavy rains raises the water table. And you have a, a big push behind the wall from the water pushing it over, exactly what we're talking about. Not very different from the, um, uh, the dam, the triangular dam type uh, free body diagram that we, we have. And so, so I don't know what the rest of this is. I guess they're talking about Santa Domingo's down here. Yeah, or is, or is, am I not doing that? Can't do it. Where is it? This is Santa Domingo down here? Interesting coastline, this one. Not a coastline, right? Uh, same. I know. <laughs> and actually, I think the two countries look very different. Isn't Haiti no forest? It's quite stark difference geographically. Yeah, yeah. And, and Dominican Republic's all forested. It's all been used for firewood, I guess, in Haiti. And so fine. So, yeah, so I don't know. I don't really have any other eye candy other than that. We've seen that. We've seen this. Well, we talked about this last time, and so we won't revisit that. Um, not so relevant for today. Yeah. Sailing um, and uh, sails or airfoils, which we haven't talked about yet. We'll talk about them in Bernoulli. Uh, and uh, next period, I guess on Friday, we'll talk about buoyancy. And so obviously boats are buoyant, uh, even when they're upside down. Um, and uh, many of the things that we're talking about today resolve, revolve around uh, forces, resolving forces, and moments. And of course, the way that you write a, a capsized sailboat is you crawl on the upturned boat and you pull down on the, the dagger board or center board or whatever you want to call it uh, and try and write it. And the things acting against you would be the fact that you're pulling the sail slowly through the water with some resistance. So there'd be some force due to that movement. And I guess it's a laser judging by the uh, emblem on the sail, uh, et cetera. So, so marginally re relevant to what we're talking about uh, today. Oh, it goes down, it doesn't go down again? Fine. So send your videos if you want them shown. Um, as I mentioned, I don't know if I did mention it, but the video that we looked at already, which was um, of a, uh, a bus going down the road, accelerating with water trapped between the double glazing and the bus, and it stacked up at the back when it accelerated, and when it decelerated, it stacked up at the forward as an illustration of uh, accelerating static fluids in a bucket that are accelerating, um, and we'll talk about that uh, I guess, uh, in 4-1, so next week, in one extra period. So, Anything we need to chat about before we get rolling? No? Good. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so let's resolve to look at this. Well, so... Well, it's un unusual. Um, I keep on getting questions about the test. Why is it only two weeks stuff instead of three weeks stuff? It's because Labor Day came a day a week early this year and was kind of linked to that. Um, Labor Day is usually on Monday, uh, beginning of the second week. And so the movies for this typically have relied on people looking at the Monday video and then us starting off on Wednesday talking about this brand new, but of course we've had the benefit of Monday together, uh, and uh, so we don't necessarily need to, to do that. Um, we talked about fluid, pressure, uh, fluid statics and fluid pressures on structures. We talked about how the fact that it relies on uh, the fluid above us to be able to identify the pressure at a point. And then that distribution is defined by that point going downwards and successively having a larger overburden weight of fluid on top of it. 
And we know what that distribution looks like because we've uh, dealt with uh, the um, uh, P is equal to unit weight times the depth plus the initial pressure at the point we begin at. And that's the easiest way for us to deal with it. And so we'd like to be able to figure out the magnitudes of pressures to be able to solve some problems. So today I think we'll go through some examples, but maybe first we define what the important features are that we now know to be self-evident, I guess. Uh, and that is that forces, the resultant force always acts normal to the surface, whether it's curved or flat. We've only talked about uh, flat ones so far. And it's equal to the, the mean pressure multiplied by the area. And this mean pressure is given by this term here, which is just the depth of the centroid times uh, the unit weight. If we need to resolve forces, we can use Pythagoras to do it, and we'll play around with that. Uh, we won't talk about buoyancy and stability today. We'll do that uh, on Friday. And we can generalize a rule that allows us to be able to say exactly where the force acts. So the force doesn't act from the place that we calculate its magnitude. And so if we look at the triangular distribution upstream of the dam, we know that if we want to calculate the resultant force, this is HC. It's the depth of the centroid, which is the x point here of that plate. Even if it's below the surface, that would be the depth of the centroid. I'll draw a figure later. But the point of action, as we saw last time, uh, for this triangular distribution is two-thirds of the height down or one-third of a height up if it intersects the water table, uh, the free surface. It's slightly different from that if it uh, isn't. And so we need to stick in your mind the fact that the depth of the centroid of the frontal area of this plane is how you calculate the resultant force, but it's not how, how you calculate where it acts. You need to do it separately. And the place where it's act is a, is a place that we'll call equal to y sub r, r being the resultant, and this just being a continuation here, right? And so we need to, and we have a standard result which we can look at. Which you can use, of course, which is the one here. And it's equal to the second moment of area about the centroid, the depth of the slope depth of the centroid, the area of the plate, and the depth, the slope depth of the centroid. So we'll explain exactly where that comes from. Ever the egghead professor want to explain why that happens. This is how we get the force, pressure times area. It gives us an expression like this. If we know uh, The force distribution, which is the resultant, we want to know the t location where it acts, y sub r. So what we could do is we could uh, look at taking moments about this point here. Don't, you don't need to necessarily, I think it's useful for perspective to see where this equation comes from. We know what fr is, we've just done it, right? We've, it's uh, fr is equal to unit weight times the depth of the centroid times the area, average pressure times area. And so we know this magnitude here. We can calculate this magnitude here by doing this integration of all these lines with the lever arm. And so we can use that to calculate yr, right? So in balancing moments, we can write that the resultant times the lever arm is equal to the moment than this free body. If we know what fr is, and we also do the integral to calculate what the moment is. So instead of just integrating the pressure on these little strips of dy, we integrate the pressure times a lever arm, the length of this lever arm times the area. We get this expression. It has an extra y in it. Instead of y, it's y squared. If we look at putting it back in for this term here and this term here, we end up getting yr, and it turns out to be this. And this term is, if we manipulate it, is this, defined in a, terms of a specific result. 
If you have your book, uh, or even if you don't, if you have these notes, you know what those standard results are. So the, the moment of area about the centroid of this plate is equal to this standard result, a twelfth times b times a cubed. And so physically what it means is if you, if you take the moments about this midpoint of this plane, uh, yeah. where, for instance, if you had uh, yeah, too much information probably for you, but anyway. if you imagine taking moments about this centroid here, it's from your statics classes. I don't know if you'd talk about beam bending in your statics classes, but if you look at taking moments for forces acting like this. If you take Galileo's beam, so you remember the famous picture of a, a beam coming out of a wall with a big weight on it? I think it's, Gal yeah, it's Galileo, right? Perhaps it's a big globe, I'm not sure. You could imagine that in, in pulling this, if you look at the center line of this, then the top is in tension and the bottom is in compression. And so if you look at the forces that would be applied across this section, then this would be negative minus VE. This would be positive in tension. In, yeah, in tension on the top. And I guess that's backwards, right? This would be in compression. This would be in tension. Uh, and so this is where this term comes from. It comes from structural engineering and beams. But, but we just need to use it as a specific result. So you have these results for these different shapes. These different shapes are gates that you'd have on submerged or plates underwater, and we can use them. And just, what is it? A, A is the depth, and B is, A is the depth, and B is the width. Right. So that's the important thing. So I'm not doing very well here. And so we can use this as a standard result. This is the second moment of area about the surface, which we want. This is the second moment of area about the centroid, which is the term we have. So we do some manipulation, and we end up with this expression. And we can also write that expression as equal to Ixc over, just by splitting it up, area times Yc plus A y c squared over a y c, which is useful because we get rid of this, and we get rid of this, and we get rid of this, and we get rid of this, then this second term is just y c. And so really what it says is that it's equal to y c plus a small amount. Okay. So let me draw that out so it's absolutely crystal clear for everything we do. It's a fundamental um, expression that we'll use. And so let me do my uh, Picasso stuff. So this is our x and y coordinate system. I'm going to be very fancy. This is x1, this is x2, this was b, right? And I'm going to draw the plate as y1, y2. It's inclined. This is the surface of our water here, horizontal, so it's a perspective picture. Um, I'm going to be super fancy and color this in. Oh, I wanted it to be a different color. Oops. Not going to take it. Did take it. This is our plate. Not so quick. And so we need to realize that the centroid of the plate is corner to corner. The balance point, if you like, which is this. And we can define a couple of 
numbers. This is YC. This length here is A, right? Very important. A is the one that goes down with depth. And if we draw a line up to the surface, this is HC. And the place where the force acts, as you know, is some other location. Let's call this delta y. And so that this total length here is y sub r. And that's important because the location where it acts is uh, the, res the resultant always acts normal to the plane. I'm not sure exactly how I should draw that. Probably I should draw it like this. So this is fr. Right? That's about as plain as I can make it. I don't know if, you, if uh, my perspective works out for you. And so from that, our fundamental expressions are that the resultant force, the magnitude of the resultant force, is equal to the unit weight times the depth of the centroid times the area. The area is equal to B times A. B times A. Um, and the depth of the, 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 the inclined distance to the centroid, it's not a depth, right? It's along the, the line of the plane. If you carried this plane up until it intersects the surface, that, this would be the trace it would make on the surface. And I can never remember exactly what these are. Let's write it as this, Ixc over Ayc. plus yc. So this is yc down to this point here, bless you. And a small amount here, this is delta y. And it's given by this expression. So for this particular plate, it is equal to um, b, 1 over 12 b a squared. a squared is always the one that goes down in depth because it's accounting for the fact that pressure is growing as you go with depth. So this is, as you go across this plate, any point across this plate will have exactly the same pressure, right? It'll be lowest here, and it'll be highest here, but it'll be, they'll all be the same pressures because it's a triangular distribution. And this is the B here, and this is the A here, standard result. And so if you know what those are, um, and so this will be, I see puzzled faces, question? Any? And so that those are standard results for us to use. Okay. I suppose the other thing that might be worthwhile doing is that we know that if uh, the plate, we know some standard results. Some standard results are if we have a fluid level like this, and we have a vertical plate, which is this, we know that the pressure distribution is going to look like this. And if this is H, then this would be uh, Fr equals gamma A H over 2. But the location of the resultant would be 2 thirds down. or one-third up from the bottom. That's a standard result. If we had a plate that was here, then the pressure distribution is going to be something like this. Still, H sub C is this. And so, Perhaps I should write this differently as um, HC, right? And you can figure out. So still this is true, but HC is different. And 
uh, you could imagine that in this case, uh, you can use our, our equation above to figure out that R, yr is going to actually uh, be at a deeper depth. And it would be, this would be yr. And I suppose also you could imagine that this could be the plate. Let's draw it this way. And then get rid of this. And so this plate would look like this also. And this would be halfway down the plate. So this would be h over 2, h over 2. This would be equal to hc. And I suppose we'd have to calculate the value of, I don't want to do that. It doesn't switch very quickly. But now in this particular case, the value of yr would be this. <coughs> and you could calculate directly from this. And then the, the other one would be running it a little bit out of space. Oh, let me do this. I'm going to be very, very clever. Oh. I've got a job as a draftsman waiting for me somewhere. Draftsperson well, would be a man for me, I guess, hopefully. So the other one, which would be a tricky one, would be this, right? What happens if it's horizontal? You know that the pressure at this point would be exactly the same as this pressure here, right, individually? So it would look like this. And that pressure here, uh, again, this would be the same pressures all the way along here. This would be HC. Take this pressure distribution bar like this. The balance point of that pressure distribution is going to be right in the middle. Right? So you could imagine it's going to act at the centroid. And so it would act right in the middle of this distribution because if you take it and balance it here, you have the same amount of force pulling down from this part of the distribution as you do pulling down from this part of the distribution. I'm trying to get rid of those. And that's why it is. But you could also calculate it from this expression here. This would be HC. You could also calculate uh, the location from this. So if you take YR as being equal to what we have here, I xc over area times yc plus yc. You can imagine that the distance to get to this would be to go infinitely far in this direction to get to y, where it intersects the, the fluid surface. So if you imagine this as being not flat, but being just slightly inclined, then to get to your intersecting surface here, this distance here, yc, has to be pretty much infinite. Um, and so, or say the, the surface, let's not do infinite, let's say it's um, a thousand meters away, till it, if you have it as a shallow enough angle. So this would be a thousand. This would be an area, this would be a thousand. And this is only a function of the geometry of the plate, right? It's one twelfth, one twelfth b a cubed. So it's only a function of the, the plate. This would be a. 
and into the page would be B, right? Because this is the one that's going to intersect the surface. And so this, so in this case, YR is equal to YC. So in other words, if you go to where it intersects the surface and you come back 1,000 meters, since we measured it from this point, that would be the point where it would be. It's the centroid of the plate. So the equation kind of works, but you have to kind of bend it around in your head a bit. It's probably better to realize that if it's a flat-lying li plane, uh, it's a uniform distribution, and it's uh, the location of the action of the pressure is just the centroid of the plate, x, x, the balance point, right? So that's the preamble. So those are the uh, expressions you need to do. Let's do some examples uh, quickly. They're in the, the notes. If you, I'm not sure how you're taking notes or whether you're using them, but this is an example uh, from the book, which you may or may not have. It's the idea of a, a gate. So you have a, a gate um, or a divider which has a circular gate in it. The gate has a fulcrum in it. It can rotate around. And because we know that if we look at the pressure distribution on that plate, it's going to look like this. We know that the point of action of this force is going to be below this point. Always has to be equal to or below the point. This, if it's below the surface, it has to be some small amount below this point because we know that this equation that we have is yc plus a small amount. can only be below it. Always is below it. And you could imagine that it's the reason it, it's below it is because it has a, a bigger distribution of pressure below it than it has above it. So if you want to keep this in equilibrium, you have to apply a force back to it to balance it if you drain the water out of this side. And the question is asking, what force do you have to apply? Or maybe, what force do you have to apply at a different location to be able to shut it? I'm not sure. I can't remember the question. Yeah. So, so I guess the question is, what force do you have to apply to be able to balance it? Obviously, if you applied a resultant force equal to this acting at the same point, it would exactly balance it. Uh, a more normal question would be, if you have a stop on this, um, to stop it going, what is the force that's applied here that it needs to resist this moment? And of course, you just take moments around this point. And so the other very important thing, I'll, point I'll make, which is, is actually an important point, is that we do these uh, three things. We calculate the magnitude of the force. <coughs> We calculate the resultants from x and y. fh squared plus fy squared uh, equals f resultant squared from that. And we have this result from taking moments about where the resultant acts. So that's part of the picture. That gives us the location where this acts. But often, we might be interested um, in defining a failure mode. And so if we want to figure out exactly how this dam would fail, if it would rotate over its toe, then when we look at resolving forces on this dam, for instance, if we have a dam that's here, let's make it just easy, and it's sitting on a surface, and we know what the force is that's acting horizontal, the And we know the weight of the dam. Then what we would want to do would be take moments for this to calculate stability. LR and, I don't know, LW. So at the point at which this would fall over would be um, just by taking moments around this point here. And so we have FR times LR, and that has to equal W. I did the wrong dimension, didn't I? This is going to be the dimension, right? This is LW, not this. And at the point that this had failed, they would be balanced. Um, if uh, WLW, WLW was larger than this, it would be stable. If the force turning it over was larger than this, it would be unstable. But this is the point. 
So we take moments around the, uh, the system uh, and we can choose anywhere to take those moments. We took them around this point here. And the first thing we talked about this morning was this, where these expressions came from, this stuff here. So that gives us this expression here. But if we want to look at how the system fails, we have to take the moments around the geometry that is, is the failing geometry. And we'll do, so we'll do that in this example. So we want to calculate what the resultant force is that's on this plate. Standard result for circular plate, if we go down, or if you go to your book, is this. Second moment of inertia around the centroid is pi r to the 4 over 4, standard result. Just like this was our other standard result, and just like these are other standard results. Don't have to derive them, just have to use them. And so this is it. What's the resultant? Resultant force is equal to HC gamma W um, area. You must say it later on, but HC is 10 meters, right? Gamma W is 10 to the 4 newtons per meter cubed. And area is pi d squared upon 4, right? And d is 10, uh, I think it's 10 meters, right, in this particular case? Does it say? Yeah. So this is 10 meters. So we can calculate the resultant. Is, is it on here? Yeah, it's down here. This is the magnitude of the resultant. We want to know where it acts. We know the centroid is at depth yc. This is yc. And so yr is equal to 10 meters. Area is pi d squared upon 4. And yc is 10 meters. What did we see? Say IXC was. It's this is IXC. So well, I guess it's in radius. So R is equal to five. Pi R squared is the same as pi D squared upon four. Substitute these numbers, and you get yc. Come on. You get yc plus delta y equals yr. yc, of course, is depth of centroid. And the delta yr is 0.62 meters below it. So we know the magnitude of the force that's acting here, and we know from the centroid depth, and we know the location of action from y sub r. And so we have both, these are the two pieces of information we need to, to solve that problem. So we've done number one. The resultant force is equal to the depth of the centroid times the area times the unit weight. We haven't done anything about uh, number two the resolving forces. Number three is the depth, the location of action is y sub r, which we know is 10 meters. We can also do that, actually the same calculation uh, going in the x direction to figure out where it acts by taking moments. It's it just all of these things which are varying vertically will be on the symmetry line of the object. You'll never have anything that's asymmetric. So it's always be on the center line of the circle the center line of the rectangle, uh, et cetera, uh, and let's not do that. And so now the third part is four, which we didn't talk about. Four is looking at a failure mode, if you like. So if you need to take moments, then you have to take moments about the way in which it's failing. And so this gate is acting around a fulcrum, and so 
uh, one force is pushing it this way, this force, and one force is pushing it the other way. And depending on the lever arms of those forces, um, they're going to be in equilibrium. So if it was 10.62 meters times FR, and you're looking at the location where it acts as 10.62 meters times F other, then they have to be the same, right? Because they exactly balance. It's a frictionless uh, um, hinge in the system. Um, and that is if the water here is filled, the resultant force on this plate has to be the same as the other side, so it exactly balances. So in other words, in this particular case, if it's filled with water, the pressure distributions on both sides would look like this. These all being arrows, etc. And so absolutely, the gate's going nowhere. Nothing happens. If you drain the right side, then you have to do something to stop it from opening. This force is acting below the, the fulcrum, and so it would want to kick out in the bottom and empty. Uh, and so to stop that, you need to apply a force at this location here. And that's basically what the question would be. What actual force, question mark, do you have to apply? And so for that, you'd want to take moments. This distance to this force is 5 meters. So the moments in this direction are 5 meters times F question mark. The moments in the other direction, and this has to equal it, are 10.62 meters times 7,700 newtons, which we know, and so we get this. And that's exactly what this is. One moment going the other way, you can write it as equal to each other, you can write them, add them together in the different senses, negative and positive rotations. Um, I think in the same way that actually we have a right-hand rule, positive x, positive y, positive z, we have a, a, a positive clockwise around an axis rule, uh, also from mechanics. Uh, so this is the vertical positive z, and this is a positive rotation around it. This is a negative rotation. But it doesn't really matter what the signs are. You can choose those just like we did before when we resolved up and down. And I got the question, uh, aren't, we, aren't you going in the wrong way? And I was, but it doesn't matter. And it turns out that the force that you need is about 1,000 thou, a kilonewtons. And um, does that make sense? Well, it does make sense. So this lever arm here is only less than a meter down. This lever arm here is five meters down. So you'd think that the ratio of these should be something like a bit more than five to one. So five times this is 5,000. It's actually 7,700. They'd be exactly in the, in the same ratio of those distances, right? Uh, so. How do we know it's five? Sorry? How do we know it's five? Why is it five meters down? Oh, because I'm saying that you put a stop here. If you are the, the boy that puts his finger in the dike, if you have a, an arrangement of a, all I'm, I'm defining the problem to say, question, if I want to drain this side, what stop do I have to put here? If I put a little uh, piece of metal here to keep the, the gate from over-rotating, how much force does that have to be able to withstand? That's what I'm doing. Okay. All right. So that's it. So uh, let's do a couple more. Um, so standard result. So this is, again, a, a, a pretend, a, a play question. Um, got water uh, behind a dam or something. You've got a dam which has a gate, which is a strange shape. It's hinged here, and so it will rotate. Um, and the question is, what force do you have to apply per unit uh, width of the dam? Its dam is three meters into the page. So this would be three meters 
into there. And so how do we calculate what's going on? So we have to calculate FR is equal to unit weight, depth of centroid area. And so this is the free body diagram. Uh, I'll sketch the pressure distribution and then remove it. This is the pressure distribution here. Well, actually, I'll leave it. And so this is going to be F1. There's also going to be a pressure distribution here. <laughs> Don't mind me. No one does. <coughs> so this height here, this pressure, has to be the same as this length here. And this would be, the res resolution of that would be F2. And we can calculate what F1 and F2 are, and then we can figure out what their moments of action are. F1, uh, depth to the centroid. Centroid is going to be in the middle of this plate. The plate is going to look like uh, this. Perspective view. This is going to be B, which is equal to 3 meters. This is going to be A, which is equal to 4 meters. And the depth of the centroid, just I'll do it for this one, but you know the deal. X to X. Corner to corner, I guess I'm trying to say. So this would be H sub C. So I'm showing it going through the concrete, but obviously it goes up to the water. H sub C is equal to 3 plus 2. Okay, yeah. Which is equal to 5. And so, unit weight of water, 9,800 newtons per meter cubed. Depth of the centroid, 3 plus 2, 5 meters. Area of the plate, 3 meters times 4 meters. Bob's your uncle, if that ex expression exists. This is the magnitude in, in newtons. Force acting horizontally. Uh, it's just the same again. Depth of the centroid has to be the full depth all the way down. 3 meters plus 4 meters. So this is 3 meters plus 4 meters. Area of the plate is 2 meters along, 3 meters into the the board or the screen, and again the same unit weight, and so we have the magnitudes. So we have both the magnitude of F1 and the magnitude of F2. We have to figure out what their lever arms are because we want to do moments about the way that this will fail. And so it'll fail only if we don't have P big enough to resist this going in this direction. These are both additive, right? This is going to be a positive, F2 is a positive, is a counterclockwise moment. Uh, F1 is also a counterclockwise moment, and P is a clockwise moment. And so we need to know, well, we can write the expression F1 plus L1. Plus, sorry, not plus. Plus F2 times. L2 equals P times this, this distance, LP. <coughs> so we know this. This is going to be the total depth of this. So it's 3 plus 4. So that's says 7. So this, this is 7. We know the force. We know the force. We know L2 because it's going to be in the middle of this plate from what we've just said. So L2, if this is, is going to be equal to 1, 1 meter. Uh, and so the only thing we've got to calculate is this. 
And once we've calculated this, we have enough to know the one variable in the equation. So we can do y sub r for this vertical one. And so that's this expression here. And so this is 1 12th, this is this expression here. 1 12th, the width into the page, board, 3 meters, times um, the depth of the plate, which is this distance. Uh, this is A, right, in this direction here. This is B, and this is A. So A is 4. cubed. So this is uh, a twelfth A B cubed. This is the depth of the centroid, which is the location where we calculated this from, which we said was 3 meters plus 2 meters. This is HC, which is this, 5, uh, plus the area uh, of the plate, 4 meters down, 3 meters into the board, and the slope distance from the surface to the centroid of the plate. Slope distance in this particular case is the vertical distance, which is 3 meters plus 2 meters, 5 meters tall. And so if you do that calculation, again, uh, we get a location of action which is slightly below the height of the centroid. You know, the middle point, if we do this on that plate, is the centroid. This is 0.267 meters below that, which you would expect, always below the, the place where you calculate that. And so we have enough now to be able to calculate L1 because we know that this depth is equal to, is it 5 point, what was it? 5 point this. And so if this value here, this is 5.267. Uh, oh, sorry, yes, no, I, I screwed up, didn't I? Okay, so this is not 5.267, it's 5.267 minus, it's just this length, the length about the fulcrum, so it's 5.267 minus 3 meters. So yes, some of these are tricky, and that's exactly what you have here. So the force multiplied by its lever arm, uh, if I can make it smaller maybe. So the force multiplied by the lever arm, lever arm is 2.267 here, plus this force times its lever arm, which is one meter, has to equal the total lever arm, which is four meters down here, times P. So the only unknown we have is this. The box in blue is for this gate, which looks like this, right, this hinge. If you look at the pressure distribution along here, what would it look like? The pressure here is equal to, um, if this is H, then this pressure distribution is equal to H gamma W. And it's just uniform across here. So I perhaps should have drawn some more arrows. So this is just the uniform pressure across this plate. Every single point across that plate will have exactly the same pressure acting on it because it's horizontal. And so um, the resultant force, this is the average pressure. The resultant force, if you remember, is equal to the average pressure times the area of which it acts. Average pressure is H gamma W. A. And this is, in this case, this is H sub C also, right? because it's all horizontal. The height of this, the depth of the centroid, the centroid is this point here, and so if the plane is landing horizontal, lying horizontally, this is clearly the depth of the centroid. Yep. Okay. Okay. 
So it becomes um, a recipe, not a, not a recipe for disaster. Yes. Yes, because what, from what, yeah, it acts in the middle of that distribution. You can think of that pressure distribution, the blue one that Keegan just asked about, being pressures of this magnitude all across the, the gate. The location of action is kind of the balance point because it's pushing down the same on each side. And you can get it from that logic. You can also get it from this logic if you need it. Okay. Um, I won't confuse you by uh, showing that you can do it in a bunch of different ways, because um, that's just not worth it. Uh, I'm not sure what this uh, figure is about. Yeah, OK. Another way, all the things that we've done with YR, you can also do by, um, actually, you can calculate the resultant just by looking at the area under this triangle. And so the area under this triangle the prism, not just the area, but the volume as you go into the page, is actually equal to the resultant force. And so you don't really need that. You can always use what we have done for the, the resultant. The other interesting way to think about it, let's do this first, is that we often work in terms of atmospheric for, uh, absolute and gauge forces. And so we've worked in gauge forces. So we're taking atmospheric as zero. So at this point here, the pressure is zero, and it gets progressively larger as you go with depth. This, of course, isn't zero. This is 100 kilonewtons, 101 kilonewtons per meter squared. <coughs> and so you can add atmospheric pressure onto this magnitude, and you can also have this same atmospheric pressure acting in the other direction. So you have atmospheric pressure. So this would be 100 kilonewtons. due to the atmosphere above us, and that would act on this side, but it would also act on this side. Just the same as when we had this opening gate, when it was filled with water on both sides, they act exactly balanced. Take the water out from the other side, they're out of balance. But in this case, we, ha we still have atmospheric pressure acting on both sides. So it's usually easier for us to do it in terms of gauge pressure, start at zero, and then this becomes whatever. And these are all zero, so we don't have to worry about calculating what they are. But if you wanted to do it in terms of atmospheric pressure, we'd add a distribution on this side and subtract a distribution on that side that exactly balance each other. And so that's worthwhile uh, being aware of. And finally, um, all of the things that we've done um, with Y sub R, we could actually calculate uh, Y sub R in this particular case by looking at the lever arms on this system here. And uh, how would I do? So if you think of this as being, I want to do anything. So, so we know that. Yeah, I guess I don't need to do that. So if you look at the pressure distribution that would occur on this inclined plate, it would be where it's shallow, it's small. Where it's deep, it's large. It has to be linear on this straight plate. And so you could split it into two distributions, one that's uniform along the plate and one that's triangular along the plate. We know that the uniform distribution, from your question right now, acts exactly in the middle at L over 2. And we know that the triangular distribution, so this would be the action of this point here. This would be L over 2. And this would be the red distribution, even though I've done it in blue. This is F rectangular. The green distribution would act at this point here, which is L times 2 over 3. So if we took moments around this point, we could calculate actually what 
the, the true lever arm was across here. Um, I guess, yeah, this point here. So you take the prismatic distribution and multiply its lever arm, this one here. You take the triangular distribution and multiply it by its lever arm, and you equate that to a, a resultant, which is FR. And FR has to equal F triangle plus F prism in terms of magnitudes, right? It's the sum of these two. And so we know what this resultant is because we know each of these. We know each of these lengths. So you can calculate what this location is. So this location would be actually where it would act. <coughs> so that's a, another physical meaning of what's going on. So, so that's it. It's a, it's a, it's a recipe to, to, to do that. Uh, next time we'll talk, we'll do perhaps some more of these. We'll talk more about buoyancy. I guess we'll talk about curved surfaces and how to solve for those. And so we'll use some of the concepts from today to, to do that. Okay. Any questions? <laughs>